Well, probably ought to get started. Uh, as you could tell, my name is Todd Hatfield with HECO Industrial Service Groups. I'm uh, Vice President of Engineering and Repair. Been involved with the company from the time that about 1980 all the way to now. Graduated from college in 1985, electrical engineering. Uh, from that point, I was involved. We had a coil manufacturing division, HECO Coil. Was involved with that, managing that, and managing uh, the uh, repair facility and doing engineering. So, kind of had did a lot of things over a period of time. Um, but my background primarily now is repairing, solving problematic motor designs, improving motor designs, uh, giving customers ideas on how to take a problematic motor and make it better. And most of the time being able to do that with the existing motor. Uh, motor components. Simple construction here. We're showing a basic induction motor, but this model can be used for all sizes. They may look a little different, but they have the basic components. You have a stator, you have the rotor, you've got bearings or some form of bearings, some kind of cooling, uh, some type of a frame. Concept is the same no matter what size. They just look different, but the, the concept is the same. Induction rotor construction. Uh, with an induction motor's rotor, as we talked before, you know, it rotates through induction, so there's no connection to the power supply. Magnetically, we're passing through the air gap. There's no connection to that rotor. As an electrical engineer, that excites me. Um, the rotor rotates from induction from the magnetic field, the rotating magnetic field of the stator. The induction is a natural phenomenon, occurs with aluminum or copper that's moved through a magnetic field and the basic construction of the rotor. Again, this will hold true on almost every design other than sometimes the rotors are aluminum, sometimes they're copper. As motors get bigger, they tend to be copper or copper alloy. Uh, but it's uh, essentially the same construction. Uh, different pictures of rotors. This is a uh, aluminum rotor on the top, a copper alloy rotor on the bottom, just showing the two basic designs and constructions. Um, common aluminum rotors, cast aluminum in this case. Uh, common copper alloy rotors, uh, you'll have rotor designs like this up here where the bars are staggered out of the slot, allowing for some airflow, acting like a fan. Uh, this is a large, actually a 5,000 horsepower rotor. Uh, uh, then you have a 3,600 RPM rotor. Uh, a whole nother beast that rotates at the higher speed and most of those designs you have to have some form of a retaining ring to hold the shorting ring from flying apart because of the centrifugal forces and then another rotor design below here just to get you familiar with the shapes and design differences this slide essentially is talking about what actually produces the torque or the torque characteristic of a motor. The rotor is actually what does it. The shape of the bar, the size and the position of the bar in the lamination, the alloy type, conductivity, resistivity, aluminum or copper, essentially copper being the alloys. And then, you know, in every induction motor design, it's the rotor that's actually determining the shape of the speed torque curve. Stators, the stator winding kind of went over this, but now you're seeing a real picture. The purpose of the stator is to carry the current that produces a rotating magnetic field and therefore induces current in the rotor and causes the rotor to rotate with the shaft and do the work. Uh, basic construction, the stator is made up of laminated silicon steel. Uh, the reason for that is if you had a solid chunk of steel with slots, you would have terrible eddy current losses and tremendous heat. They discovered this way back in the late 1800s and they said, hey, what if we do slices of metal and put it together and they're insulated? And they discovered that the heat dropped drastically to today, we're using high grade electrical grade silicon steel. Um, so laminations, hundreds and hundreds of laminations stacking that stator together. 
Uh, and then on the right, you have the stator stacked. In this case, the orientation of the slots are typically cylindrical, like what you're seeing here, but that orientation is there for a reason because it optimizes that magnetic, uh, rotating magnetic field and the, and the efficiency of that rotor rotating. This is a larger stator. We're sampling coils in the stator, fitting the coils. This is showing uh, old laminations and with degraded insulation between them and the need to replace with new laminations and, and some of the process of going through that and restacking. Large induction stators, 5,000 horsepower on the left, uh, 4,000 volt and uh, 10,000 horsepower and that one's 13.2 kV. Just showing you they come in all shapes and sizes, but the concept is the same. Uh, basic insulation design of all form coils, larger horsepower. You've got, you know, a slot that has two coil halves in it. You've got uh, the, the wire, and then the wire has what we call turn insulation. And then depending on the number of turns, you, the wire or the coil then gets wrapped with so many layers of mica depending on voltage. So similar to what I'm showing here, this is actually a 4,000 volt cutaway view of a coil. This one's actually only three turn, but it has six conductors in parallel and it's mica turn taped. A special application that they required a little more insulation. Uh, higher voltage insulation, the concept's the same. Uh, except you have thicker insulation. So you have more insulation that can handle the higher voltages, and, but the concept of the design is the same. There are some other parameters and things that get involved because when you get into higher voltages, you're dealing with corona, partial discharge, things that happen at higher voltages that you don't necessarily have the same magnitude of the problem at the lower voltages. Um, form coil lap winding, the typical consistently way motors are manufactured and wound. The coil is put into the bottom of one slot and the pitched over to the top of another slot. So you've got the first coil in. When you put the next coil in, you lap it over the first coil, hence lap winding. And for representation, what it would look like when they're all lapped together. So here's an example of a 4,000 horsepower, 4,000 volt being rewound. All the coils are almost in the unit and you're showing the coils being placed, but it gives you a feel for the geometry and shape. Mechanical blocking and bracing, very important in every uh, winding. Uh, what we're trying to show here is there's felt blocking being placed here and here. That felt blocking is actually tied and laced in. The reason for that is when a motor is energized, we all have heard of the inrush current. Well, that tremendous amount of inrush current causes a lot of heat, but it also causes a mechanical torquing or twisting of the winding, and the winding will actually try to move. So if you don't block and brace it properly, with a surge rope and so on, that winding will move and fail. So you have to mechanically block and brace it. Uh, just a quick synopsis of the winding process with a good core prepped, coils going in, uh, lifting the span to get the coils in, blocking and bracing, making what we call uh, series connections of the coils. In this case, we call it a UE connection. They can be either be stub or U connection, same connection, just a different way of doing it. Brazing the jumpers and leads, the final winding before VPI, if you're not familiar with VPI, vacuum pressure impregnation, a way of impregnating the winding, when, in our case, with an epoxy. Um, so this is after it's been VPI, but it's raw. And then this is when it was complete, baked and cured. So lower voltages, typically 230 volt, 120 up to say 600 volt, you're gonna have this type of a winding. They call it random wound. 
you're using a round wire instead of a rectangular wire. They say random because when the coils go in, or I'm sorry, the turns go in, you can see the coil shape and design. Those wires can randomly be placed into the slot. They try to place them, but they still randomly get placed versus a form coil where the conductors are positioned exactly in a position. They're not random. We're positioning them in a, in a certain orientation. Same concept, you've got ground insulation, separator, and so on. This is a, a random wound unit that has a higher coil-to-coil -coil voltage, so it requires what we call coil-to-coil -coil insulation. Random wound is interesting because on a 10-turn coil, on a form coil, turn number one's up here, turn number 10 is essentially down here. On a random wound, because they're randomly going into the slot, you can have turn number one and turn number 10 together. And then you can have that same concept from this coil to this coil. So therefore, why you have to be uh, recognizing the, the coil to coil voltage, not just the turn voltage. So just some things you have to look at in these designs. Uh, typical bearing types, just for uh, simplicity, Bearings are selected and based on essentially load, speed, temperature, and the environment. You put all that together and the designer decides the bearing system that's going to be used for the motor. Typical bearings, there's more than this, but these are just the typical designs. You've got the anti-friction ball bearing, sleeve bearing. Anti-friction being, they can be used up into the higher horsepowers, but typically they're gonna drop off around 1,000 horsepower, some, somewhere around 1,000 horsepower, maybe a little higher, a little less. You go into a sleeve bearing, it, that can vary, uh, but typically larger horsepower are gonna have sleeve bearing motors, the ones in the center. And then vertical motors, large vertical motors, typically will have what we call a tilting pad or a Kingsbury. It will also have other types of bearing designs. Uh, but these are just typical designs. 